Good evening, ladies, gentlemen, and uh, viewers uh, online, as well as in the clubhouse. I'm Gwen Robinson, past president of the Foreign Correspondents Club of Thailand and editor at large of Nikkei Asia. As you all know, we're here tonight to discuss uh, Myanmar's constitutional journey, making sense of it, which we hope will happen tonight. <laughs> to get to the um, the uh, events of tonight, I'd just like to uh, say a few words. As I think you all know, there is a ferocious battle going on in Myanmar um, following the February 1st, 2021 coup, and uh, a lot of it is on the ground and it uh, involves the military uh, attacking, um, arresting, torturing, detaining a lot of civilians in Myanmar. Um, but the other battle is uh, in some ways even um, bigger, which is over the shape of Myanmar's uh, what comes next, uh, transitional arrangements. And uh, the people who are really thinking about what next are, um, are uh, uh, now looking at the constitutional uh, arrangements uh, and there is a a current federal charter that has been agreed by an extraordinarily large number of groups in Myanmar, which has been a huge achievement to even get this far. So uh, to speak about uh, how far we've come and what comes next tonight, um, we have, I'd like, to, uh, sitting next to me in the clubhouse is Lena Rikula Tamang, International Idea Director for Asia and the Pacific. On the screen there is, on the upper left, Marcus Brand, International Idea, Head of Mission, Myanmar. On his right is Elliot Bulma, International Idea, Senior Program Officer. On the bottom left there is Jason Gelbort, Founder and CEO of Upland Advisors. And on the right, uh, bottom right is Dinza Shunleyi, Democracy and Human Rights Activist, Action Committee for Democracy Development. I think we did have Lian Sakong on the um, program, who I believe will join uh, a bit later. So right now, I would like to hand over to Lena, who's going to uh, give some opening remarks, and we'll move to the conversation. Well, thank you so much, Gwen, and thank you to the legendary FCCT, Bangkok, here for hosting us uh, tonight. On behalf of International IDEA, I wish to welcome you, uh, all the participants, online, on site. Um, thank you for coming. I'm sorry it so happens that I am the only one uh, sitting here physically with you today. And I'm also a visitor here in this city, otherwise based in Canberra, uh, Australia. So we entitled this uh, discussion, Making Sense of Myanmar's Constitutional Journey, which has been long and complicated, and where the uh, Federal Democracy Charter is now the very latest uh, milestone of this, of this journey. As many of you may know, uh, the, uh, the charter was drafted with the leadership of the Ministry for Federal Affairs, uh, NUG, and then revised by the National uh, Unity Consultative Council, NUCC, approved by the People's Assembly in January, and then made public by the NUCC about a month ago in, in April. So the aim of our discussion really is to make that federal democracy charter known to wider audiences, and also um, contribute to its interpretation um, from constitutional and from political uh, perspectives. I think, uh, yes, with this audience, uh, we don't need to go to the Myanmar's uh, political context. Maybe suffice to say that today marks one year, two months, 25 days since the military uh, Tatmadaw staged its coup and been attempting to uh, consolidate its control of the country without succeeding. And people's resistance and pushback has taken uh, many different forms. And in spite of Honta's relentless attacks, most recently, uh, particularly in Sagain region over the recent weeks, um, and no question that the situation remains harsh for those in jail, 
hiding, fighting, or simply trying to get by. And yet, the pro-democracy actors managed to design and come up with the process that made this drafting, debating, and eventually approving the Federal Democracy Charter possible. So the analysis that we have prepared, and, the, and my colleague Markus Brandt will speak to this, is really trying to answer and clarify some of the questions regarding both the content and the process of, of making this charter, and perhaps even more importantly, to assess its political and practical uh, significance. And then my colleague Elliot uh, Balmer will uh, be analyzing the same in the sort of larger historical context of Myanmar's constitution making and that of the post coup Spring Revolution by Myanmar people. And speaking of constitutional um, histories, I'm particularly glad that we hopefully have soon Lian Sakong, the minister, uh, NUG's minister for federal affairs in this panel. I met Lian in 2002, and we uh, started working on draft Myanmar's draft constitution. And I'm uh, 20 years later, I'm working with Lian on Myanmar's draft constitution. But with, while there is a certain continuity with the, with the FDC and those historical drafts, we share the view that there is a dramatic change in thinking and envisioning the fu uh, future Myanmar in, uh, in this charter. Number one, uh, I, we believe that this FDC presents or is a testimony to an unprecedented ability of this set of product, uh, broad set of actors to, to come together and to uh, find compromises over very difficult questions. I think never before there has been such a commitment to, to democracy, um, citizens' rights, uh, gender equality, minority rights, uh, federal principles, civilian control of the security forces than in this charter. And while recognizing that uh, FDC obviously is only a start of a longer process toward final constitution. And no doubt, and as is common during revolutionary times and constitutional beginnings, many questions over the legitimacy and sources of authority of the actors involved and the constitutional documents referenced uh, remain there. So the question is, and for, for also to our discussion today, whether, whether indeed the FDC and the process around it can can really serve as a trust building exercise when moving toward democratic constitutionalism and drawing that uh, final line under the era of military domination. So we are looking forward to the discussion with all of you today, hopefully with many uh, critical questions and observations that may help to take process forward. Thanks, back to you, Gwen. Thanks very much, uh, Lena. I should have said uh, we will also be taking questions from the floor and I believe over Zoom um, yeah. for those uh, watching. Um, so there will be time to do that a bit later. And <coughs> right now we're going to have a, a couple of presentations and then discussion. Uh, so I'd like to hand over to Marcus Brand um, of, to talk about the Federal Democracy Charter analysis and prospects. Uh, so over to you, Marcus. Thank you very much, Gwen. And first of all, I have to apologize for my voice. I hope I'll make it uh, through the presentation, but I hope uh -huh. you can hear me well. I'll That's try good. like this. I hope it will get better the longer I speak. So first of all, thank you very much uh, to you, Gwen, and the FCCT for partnering in this, in hosting this event. And <clears throat> thank you to all the participants uh, who join us in the audience today and uh, online. Uh, and we are very glad that we have this opportunity to start sharing this discussion with a wider audience, with wider circles. Uh, we at International IDEA have been thinking about constitutional issues related to Myanmar for the last years and especially the past year, day and night. But we believe that it is very important to uh, enlarge these circles and to bring in uh, wider circles of people into this uh, discussion. So <clears throat> what we try to achieve with these two 
papers that we are presenting today. Uh, first, I will speak about the memo on the FTC, and then my colleague Elliot will speak about another publication that we're putting out today. What we try to achieve with this is to work against the lack of information uh, and also some misunderstandings and to contribute to a constructive, inclusive debate. And we understand that this is, we're only at the beginning of such a debate. We are still a long way away from a new federal democratic constitution for Myanmar, but we believe that the Federal Democracy Charter, as Lena said, is an important milestone in that direction. <clears throat> I would also like to add a few caveats uh, at the beginning. I think, I think I'm in here. Oh, sorry. Yes. Oh. That was. Uh, that was. That's uh, good to, good to see Leah. Hello. So first of all, our analysis is an outside perspective. Uh, we are uh, an international organization. We of course have access to the Burmese language original material, but we conduct our analysis in English and mostly on the basis of the English translation. And uh, also this uh, presentation today, you hear a lot of external voices, but we just believe that this is also important uh, in terms of making sense uh, and uh, to help our friends and partners in Myanmar to make sense of their own process that they are part of. And the second uh, thing I want to mention is that, of course, we have a certain bias in the sense that we are not just external observers, but we very much want our friends in Myanmar to succeed, to be successful with that democratic transition. And we are trying our best to help them as much as we can, neutral as we are uh, within the democratic spectrum, but very much not neutral when it comes to the outcome uh, and uh, to the idea of uh, transforming the current situation into a genuine democracy. And <clears throat> also, certainly when we offer critique uh, and critical observations, this is meant in a constructive way uh, and not in, in any way to, uh, to put down the effort that has been put into the FTC. So let me now turn to the paper itself that we are sharing today, which was originally prepared on the basis of the first version of the FTC in spring 21 and initially not shared with the public because at that time uh, we at International Idea also still had people uh, working inside the country, which we don't have at the moment. We have also uh, issued a series of other papers uh, on the current situation. First and foremost, we wrote about the unconstitutionality of the coup, and we believe that it is important to keep reminding ourselves of the unconstitutionality of the military's actions. We have also published on interim constitutional arrangements. Uh, we can uh, uh, talk uh, about the elections of 2020 and the various controversies on irregularities. And we have also written about inclusion and diversity. This paper uh, is essentially divided in three parts. One is an overview of the process uh, where we look at uh, how it has been developed and uh, eventually revised uh, with the NUCC uh, and then adopted by the People's Assembly in January. Uh, secondly, we discuss <clears throat> the, what we believe is the political versus legal nature of the FTC. Uh, it is uh, difficult, uh, as I will explain, to uh, consider it a full-fledged interim constitution, uh, but it is essentially uh, an agreement between the various democratic stakeholders uh, on a, a pol political settlement with certain uh, proto-constitutional features. Uh, and thirdly, we discuss the content uh, of the Federal Democracy Charter itself. But let me get back to this uh, starting point, which is the unconstitutionality of the coup. And the question that I'm sure some of you have asked yourself is what happened to the 2008 Constitution? And I would like to recall here that, uh, as I'm sure has been discussed many times in the FCCT before, the 2008 constitution was originally affected with a serious lack of legitimacy when it was put out by the military itself. It was widely condemned internationally, even by the UN, uh, as having been imposed uh, by the military on the people of Myanmar, even though uh, a, a referendum supposedly took place uh, just a few days after the Nargis cyclone. 
but it was seriously hampered by this question on legitimacy. Nevertheless, <clears throat> after a series of elections, and in particular, after the election in 2012 that uh, uh, allowed the NLD to enter the parliament in Nepitor, uh, the 2008 constitution gradually gained legitimacy in the eyes of the international community, but also arguably in the eyes of most people in Myanmar. And it was that constitution that actually stood in the way of the military when it attempted to take power on the 1st of February last year. And it was the 2008 constitution itself that actually made the military's action unconstitutional. And I'm not gonna go into detail here, but uh, you can read about this in some of our other publications. Uh, and that in itself uh, is, I think, a very interesting starting point of where we got here. But then, even though the CRPH, the uh, committee that was formed by the MPs elected uh, in November 2020, originally still made reference to the 2008 constitution, it very quickly became clear that there was no way back to the previous status quo. Uh, when the military started to dig in and started to crack down violently against the democracy movement, it became very clear that the 2008 constitution had in fact lost the legitimacy that it may have gained over the years uh, and that the entire political spectrum could no longer imagine returning to that uh, power sharing agreement with the military. So. The CRPH uh, and the NUCC have also repeatedly stated that the 2008 constitution has become obsolete and defunct and is no longer applicable. And we also believe that this is uh, the correct way to look at this uh, and uh, that the 2008 constitution is therefore no longer valid. Also, the military has repeatedly and consistently violated its own terms and therefore is operating outside any constitutional and legal parameters. At the same time, this is also really not something very new for Myanmar. Most people in Myanmar, in fact, have lived for most of their lives without a constitution. Uh, being uh, <clears throat> subjected to military autocracy is not something uh, that is entirely new to most people in the country. Uh, so even though we as uh, outsiders find it very uncomfortable to live with what is essentially a constitutional vacuum, this is a reality that most people in Myanmar have actually experienced for a long time. Of course, with the devastating consequence of a complete lack of a rule of law and accountability and protection of individual rights. So in this situation, <clears throat> the various stakeholders came together and tried to develop a new framework. I've already mentioned the CRPH, uh, the parliament that formed itself a few days after the coup uh, and uh, in order to protect this electoral mandate that they had received. Uh, and this uh, CRPH got together with uh, initially three and now f four other groups uh, to form this broad coalition that stands behind the FTC. And uh, the FTC itself mentions these members of, the, uh, of this coalition and that is just as you know for sure, but let me repeat it, it is the elected MPs, including the CRPH, so not only the CRPH alone. It is the second group, the political parties, uh, even though it's not quite clear which political parties that includes, but I would say it is open-ended and it is open to all political parties who sign up on these principles to join this process. The third and most diverse group uh, is civil society, the civil disobedience movement and the strike committees, uh, including women's groups and youth groups uh, that bring in a lot of uh, a variety into this uh, discussion. Uh, then the fourth uh, group is uh, the ethnic resistance organizations, previously known as ethnic armed organizations. And the fifth group is the interim state councils. Uh, and again, there we are not entirely sure on the uh, identity of these because they are still in the process of forming themselves uh, and, uh, and uh, joining this process. So already we can see that this is very much a process in flux. Even the membership of the stakeholders of the FTC is not 100% clear. 
is probably open-ended and uh, in uh, an open invitation to other groups to join. And even the FTC itself is not, let's say, written in stone as it can be amended and has been amended. <clears throat> Already the first version was clearly designed to be amended and to be revised within the NUCC. Uh, and this has actually happened in a almost year-long uh, Zoom conference uh, uh, within the NUCC that has produced this second version of the FTC that we now have in front of us. <clears throat> now, let me say a few things about the political nature and why we believe that it is not really correct to consider it a full-fledged interim constitution as such. It also does not claim to be one. Um, first and foremost, there is no legal enforcement uh, uh, possible within the FTC. There is a provision for a judicial branch of government, but there is no uh, constitutional court set up or, uh, or foreseen that would allow uh, an interpretation of the constitution itself uh, and uh, that would, uh, let's say, uh, build in a system of uh, formal checks and balances as we know from other constitutions. Eventually, all disputes uh, and uh, disagreements within this institutional framework go back to the very same structure that issued the uh, FTC, namely the NUCC and the People's Assembly, which is in effect an extension of the NUCC, which includes all these five stakeholder groups that I have mentioned. So ultimately, if there are disputes in terms of interpreting the FTC's uh, provisions in terms of the procedure, in terms of uh, who does what, etc. Uh, eventually, this needs to be sorted out within the NUCC, which includes all the stakeholders. Most importantly, uh, it means that there is, uh, and I, I'm sure you have followed in recent days, the controversy uh, around the NLD's uh, statement in terms of their commitment to the process, etc. Uh, essentially, the FTC requires that everybody is on board and remains on board. Big decisions can only be taken in consensus through collective leadership if everybody agrees and if everybody uh, joins uh, the process. And that's why it took so long for the FTC to be revised. And that's why it is, in our opinion, such an achievement uh, that we now have a document that uh, is clearly based on the consensus between this very varied group of, uh, of stakeholders. <clears throat> now, briefly on the substance, uh, interesting, of course, that the uh, FTC itself is divided into two parts that have a slightly different story of how they were developed. Part one uh, essentially uh, includes the, the principles for a future constitution and is more of what you could call a, a general political agreement uh, on the, in the beginning of such a process. It starts with a preamble, it includes a pledge, uh, and it includes a number of principles uh, that should be observed uh, in the process of elaborating the new constitution. And I just want to mention here a few because they are key. Uh, one is that sovereignty uh, is uh, vested with the constituent units themselves and the people living there. And this essentially points to a rather confederal nature of the future setup in the sense that it places uh, the lead role and the key decision-making power at the subnational level, at the state level. Now, the one big question this leaves open is who these constituent units are because uh, there is no clear reference in the FTC of, uh, that would imply, let's say, a continuity of the existence of subnational unities, units from the 2008 constitution, in other words, the 14 states and regions. This is generally the assumption, uh, but there are some uh, questions uh, around this, uh, in, especially when it comes to the formation of new uh, constituent units and new territorial entities. This is one big question mark that I'm sure will still require a lot of debate and discussion. The second big feature of this, uh, these general principles is the civilian oversight of the security sector. A purely democratic civilian uh, defense and security sector that is the clearest departure from 
the 2008 constitution set up, which of course famously reserved a special role for the military, both in the security sector, but also in politics. And that is the clear cut uh, from, this, uh, from this long tradition uh, in the sense that all the uh, security uh, organizations should be under democratic civilian control. Then another feature <clears throat> is a very strong uh, set of human rights provisions, both individual and collective rights uh, that emphasize the principles of non-discrimination, inclusion and diversity. Uh, also interesting that many of these human rights provisions are formulated in the sense of all people in Myanmar and not all citizens, as was uh, the case in the 2008 constitution. And so we believe that even there, uh, the stakeholders have made a step in the right direction of extending human rights protection through constitutional law in such a future constitution. And then fourth, also not minor, is uh, the commitment to secularism uh, in this new constitutional framework. So that is part one of the FTC, and uh, you can read all the details and the nuances uh, in the memo that we are putting out. Uh, and then in the second a part of the FTC, which in a way has been the more controversial one and more, he more heavily discussed one, uh, relates to the interim constitutional arrangements, essentially for <clears throat> setting up the institutions that are supposed to govern in this interim period. And here, I think it's also very important, maybe Lian will speak more about this, to distinguish of what is in the mind of these stakeholders, the various phases of this constitution building process. Currently, we find ourselves in the interim period during which the interim national unity government uh, is in charge of the executive uh, and governed by the part two of the federal democracy charter. This is to be followed by a transitional period during which a transitional constitution will be in place that still has to be drafted uh, and uh, that will be governed by a transitional national unity government that has yet to be formed under this transitional constitution. So this in a way gives you a sense of where in the minds of the stakeholders, the train is going and what still needs to be done. And during this interim period in which we are now, we have a quite complex set of institutional arrangements which emphasizes the principle of collective leadership and consensus building. So here again, we see a very clear departure from the, let's say, majoritarian uh, winner takes all uh, unilateral type of decision making of the past into uh, a much more uh, collective uh, cooperative form of decision making, which of course also makes things more slow and cumbersome at times. Uh, as we all know, uh, the more people you have around the table, uh, each one with, uh, with effectively a veto uh, on holding up consensus that makes decision making very complicated. But once you actually have a decision, you actually really know that everybody is uh, behind. And that is why when we, <clears throat> when we now look at this complex institutional arrangement that is described to some extent in the uh, Federal Democracy Charters Part 2, then we also see that uh, many of these uh, institutions are struggling to make sense of this. Uh, and, uh, and because this is not something that any of them are used to, this is very different from the form of government that, uh, uh, that we have seen in Nepitor in recent years. Uh, and uh, we believe that uh, so far, the national unity government and even the national unity consultative council have done a reasonably good job in uh, implementing these provisions of the uh, Federal Democracy Charter. Uh, most importantly, they have formed uh, and a large number of committees, the so-called joint consultative committees uh, between the NUCC stakeholders and the NUG, uh, in which they have uh, a lot of discussions about various aspects of governance. Uh, and uh, maybe we will hear a bit more about the practical experiences on how this is going. But overall, I think what can be said is that uh, uh, what we have seen through these new institutions is the emergence of a new political culture. And that is something I want to emphasize here, 
that even though we speak about constitutional provisions, constitutional rules, uh, what is equally important is the attitude with which the various stakeholders are participating in this process. And here we have seen that a lot more voices uh, had been, have been heard within the NUCC and the various forums, uh, both those claiming electoral legitimacy, but also others uh, who claim uh, to represent uh, youth groups, women's uh, groups, uh, ethnic minorities, uh, but also just uh, civil society activists uh, and human rights advocates who have, in a way, had equal say and equal voice in these various forums and platforms. Uh, that have been uh, going on, and one, I should say, under the threat of persecution and almost entirely online. So the last thing I want to say is in terms of what is next, uh, I think one big challenge for the interim institutions is to make sure that the provisions of the FTC, and in particular the general principles for the new constitution, are widely known and are understood by the population of Myanmar also that the international community uh, uh, understands better of where uh, the democratic stakeholders want to take this journey. Uh, and this will require a lot more public engagement uh, and uh, civil participation in the elaboration, especially of the eventual constitution. And uh, this is something where we as external assistance providers also try to seek to help. Uh, and this discussion today is one such effort of trying to widen uh, the understanding, deepen the understanding uh, and widen the, the, the circles of discussion uh, because eventually only through broad discussion, uh, we will find a way ahead uh, for a democratic future of Myanmar. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Marcus, for that very clear uh, rundown. And I, I do look forward to uh, hearing what our Myanmar um, participants uh, um, think about uh, some of your points and we'll get to that but we are going to turn now to we'll just jump to our <laughs> good evening uh, sir this is Leanne Sakong NUG Minister for Federal Affairs and a very well-known personality both inside and outside Myanmar um, thanks for joining us um, you've probably heard what Marcus had to say, and I think you've got a lot to say yourself. Perhaps you could update our audience on how you're one of the key people in charge on the NUG side of uh, all we've been talking about and uh, looking at the transitional arrangements and the drawing up of the charter liaising with NUCC. So um, over to you. Uh, yes, thank you so very much for inviting me. First, I would like to express uh, my sincere thanks to International Idea, Lena, Markus, and Natalie for inviting me to join this very, very important session. I think this is uh, important because uh, our Federal Democracy Charter is, I think, a landmark in our country political history. I would like to thank also Marcus for writing this uh, wonderful paper. I think this is uh, so uh, useful for uh, a lot of us, although there are some interpretation could be, uh, I think, uh, discussed. But I think I appreciate very, very much about uh, producing uh, this paper. And first, I would like to say that um, producing this federal charter, not only the substance, but also the process was very, very important. Very, very important. Because our long history in our country history, 70 years of history, we never had such a dialogue process before. As uh, Marcus has mentioned, the process was very slow because we applied um, uh, collective leadership and then consensus decision-making process. So it takes time. And then apart from that decision-making method, uh, we have done this process online. So I think online meeting is a little bit more difficult than you know, physical meeting. So it took uh, a lot of our times. 
Uh, as Marcus has mentioned already, it started in 2021 March, and then uh, the first uh, charter was produced in 31st of March 2021. But as Marcus also clearly mentions, it was uh, not uh, completed or not perfect. So we wanted to amend or, you know, make a better charter. So the process we start again in 24th of May, 2021, and finish in 2022, January 27 to 29, when we held uh, our people's assembly. So that people assembly, we adopted this, uh, what we are uh, applying now, uh, charter part one and part two. So this process, I think, uh, is very important in itself, where many ethnic groups, many uh, groups from different back political backgrounds, religious background, uh, ethnic background, we come together, we discuss for our future. And I think we never had such experience in our country. I, in, I myself involved in the peace process from 2012 to 2020. It was a long process, it was a good discussion, but I think the way we deal each other, the way uh, we engage dialogue each other was much more better in this process. In the peace process, um, we were on the two opposite sides, the military on the one hand and ethnic arms uh, organization, we call ourselves that time, ethnic arms organization, EAO, from uh, 2012 to uh, 2015 to discuss about NCA. And then after 2016 to 2020, it was a political dialogue. So it was actually, um, it was not, uh, I must say, it was not open as now, and it was not positive as it now. So I think uh, this process, I appreciate very, very much that we need this kind of political dialogue. And I think this is only the beginning because we are in seven years of very deep, deep conflict. So we need to solve a lot more of our country problem. We need uh, this kind of dialogue process in the future also. So what we are thinking is if we are able to reach, of course we will do because we will win uh, the, pro, uh, the, the, the struggle. And when we get to transitional process, we are going to have constituent assembly where we will engage this kind of uh, dialogue process more. So I'm hoping very much that we are setting up a good example for our country. And these processes, in my view, I think this is uh, uh, a good starting point. So that is the first thing I would like to uh, say. And then in terms of the substance that we are producing, I think Marcus has already mentioned a lot about in his paper and then in his uh, presentation already. So I would not repeat so much about that uh, part of things. Um, in terms of the process, uh, I think in Charter Part 1, which is our visions, our value, where we describe very clearly, and then what kind of the country we would like to uh, rebuild and what kind of political system we want to adopt. I think this is very, very important. In our country history, the first time uh, when we have a Banglong conference in 1947, we adopted and we agree and sign Banglong agreement. And Banglong agreement actually was only nine point. And then if you look at that nine point, only two, two points, Article 5 and Article 7 only was for the future. The rest was more or less what we call now transitional arrangement. But based on that Panglong agreement, there was frontier area committee of inquiry uh, process. It took a longer time. And then there was a constituent assembly in 1947, September, uh, starting in May. 
And so that, that process also was uh, a, a good process. But I think it was, uh, we were in that times, our purpose was to gain independence as quickly as possible. So the constitutional matter was not, uh, we did, uh, our forefathers discussed enough, but it was not um, completed. So that's where we are in this constitutional crisis after uh, we gain independence. So all these problems, and then when ethnic groups demanded to change the constitution, constitutional amendment in 1961-62, and then military responded with the military coup, and then uh, military dictatorships remain till today. So these constitutional crises, we have been demanding a lot. We are from 1961, uh, from Tongchi conference in 1961, June, and then uh, Federal Seminar in 1962, uh, February and March, why we propose all these principles already. So the principle that we describe in our charter actually is if we study carefully our history, the basic, the root was already in that Panglong Agreement, uh, Frontier Area Committee of Inquiry Report, and then 1961-62 federal seminars. So this is what we collected again and that demand and again and again in our whole history. And then we came up with all these ethnic arms organization and democratic forces in 2005. And that is what we proposed again. And then that was what we have proposed again in this uh, peace process, political dialogue process. We formulated into 22 articles by PPST, uh, those who signed uh, NCA. We proposed officially in the first Union Peace Conference in uh, 2016, January. I myself submitted that proposal at the conference, but we did not get it. Why? Because military never agree with a genuine democratic principle. They never like a genuine federal system. So we could not get it. So all these things, within a few weeks actually, when we first produced this, uh, our federal charter in 2021 March, we could formulate in three weeks. We could formulate in three weeks. And then we could agree in three weeks. The principle that we could not agree with the military in five years, we could agree in three weeks. That was the difference. That's why our dialogue process was more meaningful and then more positive. And I think there is a hope for our future as well. So in this regard, uh, if you look at our charter part one and you could find five uh, guiding principles and then there will be 64 principles on federalism and fundamental rights. So this is, I think, a uh, very, very important uh, for our future. We have never produced in our country history such kind of a comprehensive democratic and federal principle. I think this is the hope for our future. I think this achievement is um, not small. It is very big step, very big achievement. So I think this is what I would like to emphasize. And then we also adopted, as Marcus has mentioned already, 12 step of roadmap in that roadmap, not only the roadmap, but you could see by producing this roadmap and this principle, you could clearly see that we rejected 2008 constitution. We rejected NCA-based roadmap. We rejected a kind of military government is now proposing uh, another election which is not meaningful for our people, which is not what our people want. So I think if you look at our roadmap, we can clearly define how we would like to change our country, how we would like to continue this process, how we would like to rebuild our country. That is clearly, you can see it. And then uh, another point that I would like to mention also is very briefly is that not only that we adopted collective leadership at consensus building, 
But also in this structure, we are based our legitimacy on uh, 2020 election result, which is what we call is uh, the jury mandate. And then also not only election result, but also CDM movement. And then we ethnic arms organizations, some of us has been struggling for 70 years. So we combine the jury mandate and the facto mandate, I think, which is very, very powerful. We never have such a mandate in our struggle. So that's why I think uh, there is a room for the whole country, the whole people from many uh, different backgrounds, different religious backgrounds, different ethnic backgrounds, different political backgrounds. We can come. We are open. And this is, uh, um, I think this is kind of uh, a process. And then we are also realized that we are not dealing with a defeated enemy. We are still dealing with a very strong enemy who is still controlling state mechanisms, who can do a lot of negative things, who can do a lot of violence things, who can kill, who can destroy people's life. So we realize that our struggle is still very big. We are in the middle of the struggle. So that's why the way we adopted the charter, maybe in some legal point of view, there might be some flaw, some weakness, but what is important is we come here together. We are united. We have the future together. We have the same, the same visions for the future together. And then this charter is, I think, our uniting point where we can build our unity. So I think this is very important. Uh, we never had such a, a charter in our history. We never had such a unity in our history. I think uh, I would not go so long, but if you look at our history, when the military coup happened in 1962, the way we respond, we are not fully united. Even in 1988, the movement was so big. That time I was a student leader, I was a student. So we students started, the whole country joined in 88. But the whole country was united in terms of democracy. As soon as we speak about federalisms and then ethnic issues and others, then we could not unite fully, completely. So that is the reason why 88 movement was not successful. It, it was supposed to be successful. It, it deserved to be successful. But in terms of what our country needs, it is not only democracy. It is a federal system. That is why our charter is called Federal Democracy Charter. And I think this is also is our, our hope and our future. Well, thank you so much for um, coming here and then I think, Marcus, uh, I would like to congratulate you. Uh, I would like to thank to International Idea for giving us and then uh, this bring us all these people and then producing this paper. Uh, I'm here to express my appreciation and then not only International Idea and our friends, but also those who are coming here and participant. And then uh, I think I envision you those who are sitting in uh, FCCT, the place where we spent a lot of our time since early 20, uh, early 20 2001 to 2008. So I think congratulations you, and you are able to sit there and then, you know, um, you might be able to enjoy uh, a cup of coffee and so on. So I think so. thank you so much for giving me a floor. Thank you so much for this event. Thank you so much for everyone. Thank you. Right. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Minister Lian, and I hope you can stick around for some questions. And uh, I'd like to turn to Thinza Shunle Yi uh, to give her view, if you're there, uh, Shunle. Uh, there she is. Hi. Um, good evening. You're, uh, you're the one on this panel who kind of bridges a lot of worlds uh, at the moment from activists and uh, different sectors, uh, women, um, you're part of uh, various groups, including the Action Committee for Democracy Development, as well as Sister to Sister, many other things. And you're very known for some of your 
incredible webcasts, uh, particularly on Sundays. And uh, so I think um, we'd love to hear from your perspective how you see this whole process that uh, that Marcus and uh, Leon Sokong have outlined so well. Um, do you see it as heading in the right direction? Uh, good evening, everyone. Ming Laba, thanks for having me here today. So, I would I would like to share you um, my three main reflections because it's already like nearly five hundred days and the coup attempt. So in the very beginning, it's been really tiring, mentally draining. But I think we have gone so far till today. Um, there is no like we never skip a day without protest without. You know, because the hostility from the military is um, every day. They don't, they didn't take a break. So we don't take a break too. Because of the hostility is really strong, the resistance is really strong. So every day we live through daily, you know, news about what's happening in the country. So recently, yesterday, um, five years old was, you know, blown out because of the artillery share in Mindachin State. And just today I'm involved in play Blair Township in Maguey that, you know, five men's old were just blown out because, because of that bone left inside their house without knowing that the, the military raided in their house and they left it and the, the kids were playing around it and it just, so all these new coming up, never, you know, we never pass a day without those terrible, you know, hostile um, situations. But I would say, um, I have three main reflections. The first is I'm stay optimistic with what's happening in Myanmar. We are on the track. It's more like a beautiful trouble um, with the beautiful disputes and mistrust a man asked. We, you know, we have an everyday discussion and meeting a man asked. We dispute. We had a lot of um, debates and, you know, different dramas and dynamic a man asked. But I stay feel I'm, we are on the right track. We are heading towards where we are supposed to go. So for example, when you, when you go for shopping, you try to find something that fit with you. Like I always feel in my whole year, whole decade long activism, like I'm always wearing something that does not fit with me. I'm suffocated in my own dress. That was 2008 constitution. So in the in the previous election, I decided to take it off myself as an individual. And after a year, um, amazingly, like everybody decided to take it off. No, we don't want it anymore. But because that dress is not for us, it's not for. It may be good for some part of our body, but that's not fit with all of our body. So now, we are now left naked. But I think it's better. <laughs> Um, being, you know, in a round dress than being naked, but now we're trying to have a new dress that fit with, with all our body parts. So that will be for us and we are on the way for it. So we are stay on the right track. So that's the first uh, reflection. And, you know, then some maybe some of us were depressed, like sometime, of course, some of the day we ended up with depressed news that some of the dynamic and dramas that I always remind myself in the end of the day, that's who we are, because that will never happen in the military uh, roadmaps, because military never, um, the military or the military groups will never encourage different diverse opinions. That could only happen in a democratic process, and that's who we are and how we are. Um, that's the first reflection. And the second one is, it's a, it's a reminder to me every day. I live with this. It's an all around, all around revolution. We call it as a revolution. We need to treat it as it is. It's, it's not just a, a resistant or a anti-coup protest. It's a revolution that is shaking and shocking the system that is so normalized system, you know, and the 2008 constitution. So we are revealing all our weaknesses and also we are um, showing our strengths and men us so that's how this is all about right now and um, for that we are not just talking about institution we're not just talking about military we're not taking a revenge we are talking about ideologies that will lead us to where we are supposed to be so it's an ideological revolution that talk about different ideas not just about 
you know, militarism or rising uh, patriarchy, but also racism, hegemonism, supremacism, um, and are a new ground federal democracy. It's not just a democratic ground that we are sitting on a federal democracy ground. So we need to add like one and we're still trying to normalize it. So there are a lot of things that we don't fit in this roadmap that is so new to us. We have zero experiences in this roadmap, but we are going forward every day. So for that reminder, I think this revolution has given us two reminder. The first is because it's a revolution, we think of the most oppressed people because freedom for the most oppressed is freedom for all of us. So whatever we do, we think of would this cover, would this benefit to the most oppressed as well? So that's the first reminder, whatever I do, I think of the most oppressed. And the second reminder is we are scripting our own romance where we own the narrative, where we are the script writer. We are not at us. So recently the military just called for a dialogue. They want to be the script writer. They want to be the main, ad, like, main host where everyone else be at, they are at us. We refuse to play with their script anymore. We are scripting our own roadmap, our own scripts. So true thick and thin, it will take time because now we have twist up in the roadmap in the Federal Democracy Charter that we are going forward. We are already on seven step. If we could go for seven step, then we can go for the next few step. But we need your help and solidarity and support along the way so that we can finish. We can reach to our different step. And the last reflection is um, we're not letting go things lose and lost on the way at the same time, despite all the different news and hostility, atrocity happening around the whole country. We always trying to check and balance each other. I think that's the main concept and essence of the federal democracy charter, check and balancing. And collective leadership needs check and balancing at the same time. So that's something that was lacking in the past five years or 10 years as well. Also, that is something we can find in a military drafted roadmaps because that's not democratic. In military, we never have that kind of process that allow freedom of expression, that allow them to criticize or have different diverse opinions coming out from different diverse group. And that's who we are, how beautiful we are, that we have different opinions, we have critics, we have someone, we have like optimists, we have pessimists, but we all uh, um, value, you know, free and our expression as the main essence in this roadmap. So these are the three main um, uh, reflection I have today. And I have a three main ask um, to all of you. The first ask is, this is a revolution that will be beneficial for all of us, including you sitting in the room um, with us because you know we are proving to our young generations that military roles is in the security sector. They are roles will never be in the political sector. So we are proving to our future generations how a democratic country should behave, how we are united as democratic countries against all forms of dictatorship. So that's how I think we need dialogue more than ever. We need dialogue. Now, many of us are start talking about dialogue, right? From different stakeholder. I will agree with you, we need dialogue more than ever. But dialogue amend us, dialogue amend the ethnic minorities, dialogue amend the religious minorities with us. And the FTC already have set the role of the military. If they want to play a role, they can stay play a role but under the civilian government. Um, I've been advocating for more defections. We have more than 10,000 soldiers defected. We are advocating for their rights for everyone, including soldiers and their families. So I always remind, we always need to remind ourselves that whatever we are doing will be beneficial for all of, all of us, including those soldiers killing us but that will be beneficial for them as well. And this is a message we've been signaling. Whatever we are doing will be beneficial for your generations too. You will not be left alone. Everyone will be included in this. So 
I think we have a role to play for all of us, everyone. That's a first us. And the second is we need a parallel process at the same time. The first is I'm really glad that um, IDEA, international IDEA, could manage to you know, analyze what is happening, inform you, and that's really needed. That's advocacy. And you know, we work closely with the policy um, decision makers and stuff. But at the same time, we need a parallel process about awareness reasons. As I said, we have zero experiences. We've never been here. So we need help, we need support and help each other. Awareness reasons, not just to the audience, but to the leaders in the NUD, NUCC. We need awareness reason about democratic principle, how we think, how to build political tolerance, why we are having political dialogues and men asked. I think that's something missing right now. We need to grow thick skin and men asked. Mm -hmm. um, and we need awareness raising. And the last S is, as a civil society grassroots coalition, we may not be that visible right now, but we are there. We are organizing for another push on the ground. We are organizing. We are planning for another round of public movement. And we need you, um, international actor, including donor organization, governments to help organize on the ground. Now we need more than ever that we need humanitarian system. We need many because there are many needs in different places, but we need to balance. We also need right-based action. So not just need-based budget, but also right-based budget dedicated only for awareness reason about right-based action, non-violent, you know, creative online, offline action. So these are the three main acts for me today. Um, and three main reflection. Thank you so much for having me today. Uh, Tinza Chun Lei Yi, thank you very much. Uh, you've left us with some very striking images, including new dresses and old dresses, and uh, and also you mentioned a very interesting figure of ten thousand soldiers defecting. You do a lot of work with defectors, uh, military defectors. Um, do you mean also police and and military and soldiers? Right. That's yes. Okay. Well, we'll um, please chip in later when we move to discussion. I'm sure there'll be questions. And uh, we're going to first, uh, sorry, Jason, we're going to go to Elliot Bulma, who's um, in Africa and has managed to get back online. Well, welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. And thank you to everybody who's been involved in organizing this launch, launch event. Um, I am pleased to be here to present a new international idea publication, a new constitution for Myanmar towards consensus on an inclusive federal democracy. My name is Elliot Bulmer. I'm a senior program officer with international idea specializing in constitution building. I'm currently based in Sudan, hence the poor internet connection, I apologize. But between 2015 and 2020, I was closely involved in international ideas constitutional work in Myanmar, including in the MICON project delivering constitutional academies. I'm going to talk a little bit about this publication, why it was written and its relevance. I, I can't hear the translation, so I don't know whether you're keeping up, but I'm just going to try and take a little pause after each sentence to give you time. That's working well, thank you. Okay, the idea for the publication came in February 2021. As we have already heard, up until that time, the 2008 constitution, while widely disliked, both for its undemocratic origins and its less than fully democratic content, was accepted on practical grounds as the only game in town. That constitution, represented the common ground on which the military and the NLD government could, at least to a limited degree, cooperate or coexist while respecting the other's positions within a fragile but balanced system. Any constitutional change in the direction of greater civilianization, democratization, and federalism 
was expected to have taken place within that framework of the 2008 constitution, uh, which meant that it would have to pass the threshold of amendment specified by chapter 12. In practice, as I'm sure we are all aware, the need for a three-fourths majority as required by Article 436, combined with the allocation of 25% of the members to the military, meant that any constitutional change was expected to proceed cautiously, incrementally, and only with the consent of the military. The constitutional amendments presented by the NLD in 2019 were of this spirit, uh, proposing only minimal changes to the 2008 constitution, the most crucial of which was a very gradual reduction over time of the military component in both houses. As we have heard, however, the coup changed that. The fragile balance between the military and civilian parts of the government was broken. The 2008 constitution was ruptured. It became uh -oh. clear that uh -oh. building a genuinely inclusive federal democracy in Myanmar would have to take a different path. One that would reject the gradual amendment of the 2008 constitution and would seek to replace it with a new constitution. How then can a constitution, a new constitution, be devised? On what principles should it be based? What institutional form would it take? And how does Myanmar go about writing a new constitution? As we have seen, the revised federal democracy charter has a lot to say about the future constitution of Myanmar both in terms of the process by which the constitution will be agreed and in terms of its substance. According to the Federal Democracy Charter, Myanmar will be a parliamentary democracy with a decentralized federal structure, a bicameral parliament, a stronger bill of rights, a new range of independent commissions and a secular state. Indeed, as this paper I am presenting points out, there is a broad commitment across the pro-democracy movement in Myanmar to these principles of democracy, parliamentarism, human rights, federalism, constitutionalism, and civilian control of the armed forces. Nevertheless, there are many details still to be worked out. Even if political agreement can be reached on general principles, developing a new constitution uh, Elliot, I think we're, you're, you're breaking up a little bit. Operationalization of those principles. Um, sorry, Elliot, I think you're breaking up a bit. So it requires the operationalization of these principles into a robust and workable legal framework. However, as we look at constitution building around the world, we see that constitutions are very rarely entirely new. Constitutions, like all institutions, are shaped by a process of what political scientists call path dependency. Path dependency is a historical inertia. It means that future solutions must be found within the range of available or exceptional options that are based, to some extent at least, on the history of a country. The problems facing countries tend to be quite constant over time, and so do the differences between people and how to resolve these problems. In many countries, we see the same debates resurfacing over time with similar constitutional experiments being repeated until they are eventually resolved and settled. So in many comparative cases, so-called new constitutions build upon previous constitutional examples in a country's history, or at least on principles that can be derived from the country's constitutional history. In part, this is because people are used to or familiar with those previous constitutions. If a previous constitution from before the collapse of a democratic system is no longer suitable or cannot be restored, it might nevertheless retain some symbolic legitimating value. It can be a source of inspiration or certain principles might be derived from it. That's one area where this paper might help. It's designed to help decision makers in Myanmar trace the historical trajectory of Myanmar's constitutions. Particular attention is paid to the 1947 constitution, arguably Myanmar's only democratic constitution to date. The aim is not to copy it, not to restore it, but perhaps to see within it certain principles, even certain specific provisions 
that could still be acceptable or relevant. That is only one small part, however, of the historical legacy of constitutionalism in Myanmar. As many here will be aware, the process of thinking about a new democratic federal constitution for Myanmar has been going on for a long time. Many foundations have already been laid on which future constitution builders can base their work. This paper therefore examines in detail the draft constitution worked on over many years by the Federal Constitutional Drafting and Coordinating Committee, the FCDCC, with amendments proposed by the United Nationalities Federal Council, the UNFC. This draft, as the paper analyzes, is not perfect, final, or complete. It does, however, represent an example of what a constitution operationalizing the principles of the F FDC might broadly look like, and therefore might provide a reasonable and helpful basis for future discussion. What is not said is often as important as what is said. Political agreements, like the F FDC, tend to focus on contentious matters, but getting a good constitution requires attention to be paid even to the non-contentious or little considered aspects of constitutional design. In the last 18 months, four countries in the Asia Pacific region, Pakistan, Malaysia, Nepal, and Samoa have had constitutional crises caused in part by the insufficiently clear wording of their rules on government formation, government removal, and the summoning and dissolution of parliament. These details matter. And the detailed study of former constitutional drafts as set out in this paper may contribute to that process. For example, these rules on how parliamentarism works and the exact limits of the discretionary power of the president in a parliamentary democracy are quite well handled in the 1947 constitution and in the FCDCC UNFC draft. Other matters also important such as the constitutional provisions relating to the composition and independence of bodies such as the Electoral Commission, the Human Rights Commission, and the Civil Service Commission are arguably less well handled in that draft and might benefit from further consideration. In short, this paper aims to support Myanmar's democratic federal constitution makers by helping them to rediscover the work that has already been done, to learn from it, and to apply it and therefore to help reach a new constitution that is as good as possible, as easily as possible. I wish all well in that endeavor. Thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, Elliot. I'd like to turn now to Jason. Um, Jason, you've been working very closely on these issues uh, with some, uh, some key people involved in um, in uh, considering the shape of uh, the new um, constitution. So let's hear your view. Uh, thank you. Thank you to the FCCT and International IDEA for hosting and organizing this event. It's a pleasure to be here with my fellow panelists and everyone joining. I am very glad to see International IDEA providing its analysis of the Federal Democracy Charter, as well as those uh, earlier constitutions and the draft federal constitution. I very much agree that it is important to encourage this discussion about these processes and issues. I will try to contribute some additional thoughts related to uh, those documents and the discussion we've had so far today. Um, and uh, I, I greatly appreciate the, all, all of the discussion that's been shared up until this point. Uh, the previous speakers have pointed out that this is currently an incredibly dynamic and unique time. There has been a constitutional break since the 1st of February, 2021. And there are many challenges ahead for the numerous stakeholders who are seeking a better future for their communities and for their country. While recognizing these challenges, it is important to also recognize what has been achieved so far with the charter. It is quite remarkable to have a process with as many diverse participants as this one, although still working for greater inclusion of key stakeholders, that uses a consensus-based decision-making process to resolve contentious issues. And this has been taking place under the most difficult external pressures. The extensive work carried out by many different stakeholders in recent years and over decades, preparing principles and details related to federalism, democracy, rights, among other issues, has contributed 
along with the new energy and political changes over the past year and a half, to the ability to prepare and agree to the political principles in this charter. Um, I think it was described quite well, but I, I think the charter uh, covers three main elements. One, it presents political principles that bind stakeholders in the present and for future constitution making. Two, it provides a roadmap outlining a three-stage constitution making process. And three, it includes the interim governance arrangements describing the relevant institutions, including the People's Assembly, NUG, NUCC, CRPH, judiciary, and state level institutions. The revisions to the charter over the course of about a year included significant changes. Um, some of these include changes to the interim governance structures and recognition of the roles of ethnic administrations for justice and security matters. Uh, I would like to also mention that in addition to the two papers launched by International IDEA today, I would highly recommend their 2015 publication titled Interim Constitutions, Peacekeeping and Democracy Building Tools, which is cited by the memo and I think Marcus mentioned also. That paper uh, shows how multi-stage approaches to constitution making are increasingly common, especially in cases of overcoming civil wars or authoritarian regimes. As the new IDEA memo mentions, pre-peace agreement constitutional instruments are typically less thick or less detailed than those that are drafted in post-agreement contexts. This leads me to one point where my view differs from uh, what Marcus described and, and what's in the memo's analysis. Uh, he explained that the charter is not an interim constitution. Uh, the memo does call the charter a constitutional instrument and the charter does appeal up to me appears to fulfill the provided definition of an interim constitution that it is a constituent instrument that asserts legal supremacy it is limited tempor temporally and provides for a future constitutional process however the memo adds additional requirements related to checks and balances and levels of detail uh, i don't think that full separation of powers and institutions like constitutional tribunals are requirements for a constitution those are normative uh, ideas that we might consider important for democratic and federal design within a constitution. There are certainly constitutions, including in Myanmar's own history, it was pointed out that there is perhaps one uh, constitution in Myanmar's history that we would consider democratic. Um, and so many constitutions lack these features on paper and in practice. We still consider them constitutions. Uh, in addition, my reading of the charter is that it does have checks and balances across the various institutions. And although the section on the judiciary may be fairly brief, the judiciary is given important powers and the potential to develop over time as judiciaries have in countries around the world. Aspects of this design may be unique, but context drives many of these elements. Um, I would suggest that it will be up to the people and governing institutions of Myanmar to determine whether they call the charter their interim constitution now or in the future. But the text to me appears to include the necessary features for us to think about it in this way. One particularly interesting feature of the charter is that it sets out this three-stage process for constitution making. There are more steps provided within those stages in the charter, but they can be grouped into these three stages uh, as was outlined also earlier. First, the current interim period governed by the Federal Democracy Charter. Second, the transitional period, which will be governed by a transitional constitution and we'll continue to use part one of the charter to guide the constitution making process. And then a final democratic constitution that will replace the transitional constitution. Um, this uh, I think is very important and significant. It has some important uh, potential benefits. This multi-stage process commits stakeholders to key principles, but avoids rushing to lock in detailed decisions prematurely. It may enable a more inclusive and participatory process in later stages. Furthermore, using these three stages reflects the reality of the current context, that the priorities and needs for governance during this revolutionary period are different than those for later periods. We will see whether this may permit adaptability over time and perhaps also broader inclusion across federal units and ethnic areas that could use their own governance structures within the shared federal system during this period. The other idea paper looks at the constitutional history and the 2016 draft of the federal constitution. 
I suggest viewing that draft federal constitution as the product of more than a decade of intensive work by ethnic resistance organizations, political parties, other democratic forces, and civil society representatives. There are multiple important inputs for the continuing constitution making process, and the draft federal constitution will likely be one of them. Um, so th the analysis on that is very welcome, I think, and, and will, I'm sure, be very useful. Uh, Elliot has also authored other useful international idea publications that uh, I would love to mention, including on federalism. I think those are available online in, in Myanmar and English. Um, so it, again, it's wonderful to see his analysis of these other source documents. Um, I'll again share uh, one point of difference in my perspective, which is um, I don't think a comparison of the 2016 document and the current charter can accurately reveal what in the paper are called points of divergence between democratic stakeholders, especially given that the charter was agreed upon by many of those democratic stakeholders themselves. Uh, there are, of course, many different points of view and positions across stakeholders, including other relevant ethnic stakeholders that have not been involved in the drafting of one or both of these documents. However, these two documents were drafted years apart with massive political changes taking place in between Probably all the relevant stakeholders have continued to refine their policies and positions over that time frame. And uh, as was described, I think that the paper's analysis highlights the changes that have developed over time uh, on many topics. And many of those uh, differences are uh, points for future development that will be worked on in more detail in the future constitution making stages and will require ongoing study um, to carry out effectively. The multi-stage constitution making process outlined in the charter, if implemented well, may aid in helping stakeholders come together to resolve those differences and agree on those details in the right sequence and at the right time. Uh, there was some discussion of the current challenges uh, today. I think implementing the federal democracy charter's interim constitutional arrangements is the urgent challenge. There are immediate needs related to governance at all levels, including making service delivery more effective. This requires building trust and coordination. Implementation can often be more challenging than design and drafting. It will require a lot of effort and is already the focus of much critical work. Disputes are to be expected. Agreement on the charter has already been used in efforts to resolve conflicts around governance, and it will hopefully help prevent some disputes in the future. There are, of course, parts of the charter that can be seen as gaps or areas for further work. Some of these can be improved through the implementation of the charter itself. Other areas are intended to be worked on during the next two stages of the constitutional development. The agreements in the charter on democracy, federalism, rights, and security, which uh, others have described, I think, very well, and I would encourage everyone to read in detail, have the promise to be transformational if the charter does become the foundation for continuing constitutional design. Thank you again to everyone, um, and I look forward to the continued discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Jason, for that uh, rundown. I think we've had an, a really excellent uh, array of views from our speakers, and uh, we'd welcome questions um, uh, either addressed generally to the panel or specific panelists, but. I'd just like to, um, oh, I can see uh, my colleague over there, May Wong, is up there. I'm just going to, uh, if you don't mind, May, uh, have a uh, leap in there and just, um, I'd just like to ask Leon, uh, as the, uh, well, as many things, uh, but you're both a very prominent uh, representative of the ethnic community in Myanmar. Uh, with a long history of involvement on that side and now as NUG Minister for Federal Affairs and uh, and uh, fundamental to this process that's going on. And um, you have been closely involved with the NUCC, so you're really uh, the man, uh, a man in the middle there. Um, what, do, what do you see as the most important next step. I think some of the issues raised here have actually highlighted also a lot of concerns about the dominance of uh, the NUG in the process and NLD, and I know you speakers have raised all that, but um, do you think uh, there's more 
confidence building that needs to be done? Can it be done through this uh, uh, constitution process? Um, perhaps you could make a comment on that. Uh, thank you very much, Gwen, uh, for this uh, interesting and important question. I think uh, constitution making through NUCC and then uh, collaboration with NGUG, I think is a very important uh, mechanism that we are creating in this process. And as you know, NGUCC is where we make collectively policy and then NGUG is where we are implementing the policy that we made together at uh, NGUCC. So the way we are working together now is between NGUG and NGUCC, we form what we call is joint coordinating committee. So now we have nine joint coordinating committees between NGUG and NGUCC. One of them is called uh, JCC Federal, Joint Coordinating Committee for Federal's, uh, I think, constitutional issue, making constitutions. So currently what we are doing, what we are looking at is based on the charter, we are looking at three tasks. Um, number one is uh, how we are going to overcome this transitional process. So we are preparing for transitional arrangement. That transitional arrangement include uh, prepare, preparing for transitional constitution itself. And then in that constitution, uh, transitional constitution, what will be important is during that transitional period, how we are going to make a permanent or a future constitution. For that reason, how we are going to design or establish constituent assembly. In our history in 1947, in September, we have the Constituent, Assem uh, Constituent uh, Assembly, yes, and that was the one who adopted 1947 a democratic constitution. So we are thinking again to adopt that kind of uh, design. And then where um, uh, that Constituent Assembly should be as inclusive as possible, because Constitution belong to everyone in the country. Although maybe we are not the same from, uh, we are, maybe we will be a very different political spectrum. Our political view might be very different, but we are in this country and we belong the future together. So the constitution is for our future. So I think for constitutional matter, no matter who we are, we should be in this process. So we are thinking to design this kind of constituent assembly as inclusive as possible. And constitution making process should be as open as possible because we need our people to be involved in the process. As we all know, 1974 constitution drafting process, making process, and the 2008 constitution making process. In those processes, people were not there. The dictators, the dictators draft, the dictators uh, imposed on the people. So it did not last long. So if we want a peaceful country where everyone live together from many different backgrounds, different ethnic background, religious background, if we want a peaceful society where we can live all together peacefully, I think this constitution making process should be as inclusive as possible. So this is what uh, kind of our design. So to answer your question, I think constitution making process is a process of not only making or designing our future, but also where we can reconcile many different, different background, different in terms of uh, many things. I think this is a very, very important. For that reason, I think uh, what we achieve through this charter is very important because this is the principle. And mm -hmm. I would like to uh, mention a little bit about what Elliot is saying about FCDCC uh, drafting process. I was one of secretariat member from the very beginning till the end of FCDCC process. And 
Elliot mentioned, you mentioned about the lack of political agreement on that process. I think actually, before we started that FCDCC drafting process, in 2005, February 9 to 12, we have a big conference, a big conference in Taibama border, and then where we agree upon eight basic principles for future federal union. This is eight basic principles. But if we break down those eight basic principles, it's become 36 principles. That is where we are still standing together. I think that political agreement was translated into that constitution. So uh, that uh, eight basic principle, we just call eight basic principle. If we break down that eight basic principles, the 36. So I think that is very, very important uh, mm. historical event that uh, we all should not forget. And this is the way we are doing is, uh, I think we are repeating ourselves, uh, starting with political agreement, as uh, Jason has mentioned, political agreement on that our charter, and then of course, drafting process. Currently is, uh, since we are in the struggle, we since we are in the revolutions, uh, we cannot, uh, be op as open as possible we want um, what i'm trying to say is that inclusiveness is here still limited because this is a revolution because who can participate in these processes who can openly declare ourselves as who against these military regimes but uh, most of us do not like the military dictatorship but because of many many situations and many many concerns a lot of people and a lot of groups are not able to participate in this process. But in the future, we are going to invite them. And in the future, all should be as much as possible in both. I think I answered uh, your question, Gwen. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, spot on. Um, so we'll just turn now to uh, Mei Wong over there. You can. Good evening, Mei Wong from CNA. Dr. Lien, so good to see you on camera and in person as well on screen. Thank and you. also, Tinza Shunlei, it's been a while since I last saw you guys. Um, I've got two questions, really. Uh, actually, actually going to be channeled to the both of you specifically. One is the fact that repeatedly you've said that the federal constitution drawn up by the NUG has to be and is open and inclusive. However, with the Rohingyas kind of left out of the picture, as well as WA, and also with the Rakhine, Arakan army, that seems to be also left out of this whole equation. How do you intend to address that to make that an inclusive, as well as uh, you know, an open constitution? My second question is, how do you intend to actually draw in the other ethnic arm organizations, such as the RCSS, which you have seen very recently engaging with the Tatmadaw behind your backs in a way. And, and, and Dr. Lian, you're an expert in this, so please shed some light on this. Thank you. Thanks, May, for an interesting question. So over to you, <laughs> Dr. Lian. Well, I'll try to be very brief. I'll try to be very brief. As my, I mentioned, uh, we are now in a revolution. A revolution is those who are fighting. So, uh, of course, uh, the group that you mentioned, for example, WA, AA, and Rohingya, they are also fighting. But um, the, in the current situations, because of a, a certain concerns, we are not in uh, the same uh, room together yet. So. That's why our process currently under this revolutionary period is, in shrimp period, is still very limited. That's why we want another more open, more inclusive, more inclusive processes is needed. That's why we are looking for the transitional period, where we should not forget everyone. Yes, we know there is a limitation. Yes, we know some of our good friends are not able to involve yet. Uh, about RCSS, uh, they are involved in um, the drafting of the charter until almost uh, when we have uh, people assembly. So they were in the, the char charter drafting process, but unfortunately they are not able to join NUG and NUCC yet. We are hoping uh, 
uh, we are not giving up. They are, you know, um, uh, 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 they are struggling for uh, democracy and uh, federalism, uh, the better future. So I think uh, we are in the same boat, but unfortunately, this is not the time we are not able to sit together yet. And I, I, I'm, I'm hope that we'll soon be sitting together and fighting together again. Would you care to comment on the uh, on the aftermath of that historic meeting between AA and uh, NUG uh, just last week? They were just a oh very yes, I, I was in the meeting. Yes, uh, I think I must confess that before that meeting <laughs> event, we have a series, uh, a number of uh, informal kind of conversation was happening, and then yes, uh, I think uh, the last meetings. Uh, we are, they are willing to, you know, uh, uh, make, uh, you know, uh, let the people know, let the, the press know. That was very open, openness that uh, they kindly give us. Uh, so I think we have been, uh, I must mention also that the group that you mentioned, or you, as you are not mentioning, in under NGUG, we have what we call is Alliance Committee. That Alliance Committee is chaired by our foreign minister, Do Zimao. And then we are that committee meeting all the uh, ethnic uh, resistant groups uh, and political parties, and then all the concerned groups, time to time, almost every week. So I think we have been a series of series of meetings, which we are not uh, necessarily, uh, you know, um, uh, disclosed. Uh, we are not uh, closing uh, disclosed yet. Right. So. Well, I think mm. a lot of hopes have been raised by that, so maybe you can build on uh, on that uh, step and we can see more. Um, and uh, as May mentioned, uh, we'd like to hear from you, Thin Sa Shun Yi, about, uh, well, maybe the broader question as well of this inclusivity uh, question, uh, particularly uh, regarding um, minorities such as Rohingya and uh, and the other groups. Yeah. What's your view on that? Is there enough right now? Does more need to be done? And how do you do it? So I always advocate for inclusive participatory process, whatever we're doing, wherever we are, whenever we are, right? So um, basically our main concept is freedom for the most oppressed will be the freedom for all of us. So unless we can include the most oppressed population in our process this will never be a strong foundation for a future step that will break through that will just break down because since the very beginning we need to make sure everybody you know everyone's involved it's not just about the result it's about the process so as a civil society um advocate we always um, think of we we can never skip process. We need to have a, a proper step and the process to go to where we are. For example, drafting constitution, we can just adopt it within a, a day because there are many different already drafted constitution. We have different resources, different resource person who can just draft it within a few days. But we need a strong process where everybody feel their voices are heard and everybody feel they can participate. That's why I think the FTC, for example, what was passed in the past uh, people assembly with remark. So General Strike Committee, uh, where I'm at part of, we made several comments on this. This was not a, a, a complete one yet. There are things to improve. So that was passed that way. So we have a way forward and there are things to improve for us. So I would say right now in the NUCC, before it was 28 group, now we have 33 organizations as a part of the NUCC. And one of them is a, a Rohingya woman-led organization. So it's a good start, but we need more. Of course, it's never enough. We need more of a different ethnic groups be a part of it. And I think that's what NUCC should be more transparent, but in a way to be sensitive with their security because some of the members cannot expose who they are. Uh, but I think um, we need we need more communication uh, as an NUCC to the wider audience. So what what we are doing, what the NUCC is doing at the moment, especially with the Federal Democracy Charter, 
So regarding as um, different ethnic revolutionary group who have signed NCA meeting me online, I'm, I'm not surprised. You know, we need to sell, I mean, as our own roadmap better. We need to make sure we are a strong process where it's reliable and credible, where it can guarantee for a true federal democratic union. Because the military is now also saying we are going for federal democracy. And some of the ethnic revolutionary group might think military might have a more leverage, more way of doing things. But as the NUCC, NUD, as the revolutionary group, must have um, done better to prove that our roadmap is a better way forward. So that's how I think um, uh, we need more, more of a work and us more transparent participatory process. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Shunlei. I think you've just outlined one of the NUG's uh, big, biggest challenges, uh, but that's, uh, that's for another whole evening of discussion, I think. We're drawing to a close. Uh, we've got some online questions. I'd just like to maybe throw this open to uh, the panellists. Um, we don't have identification on the Zoom, uh, on the Zoom link. Uh, these are, are two, I'm going to put them together and I think we can end with, oh, we've got one more in-house question there. I think we can probably fit that in, Tony. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll start with you and then we'll go to the online question. Okay. Thanks, thanks, Gwen. Um, Tony Davis, I, I write for the Jones Defence Publications. What I'm hoping to get is, is more clarification from the panel than a specific answer to a specific question. What I see happening in Myanmar very, very broadly is two things. One, as several panelists have pointed out, there's a revolution going on, right? Which is by definition a chaotic process. Uh, we're seeing events happening in the center of the country, in Sagai and in Magwe, which are horrific. We're seeing uh, forces in the periphery, the Wa state, or the Wa area, Rakhine, Chin State, all, all across the country, everything is in flux. The second process, which we've heard a lot about this evening, is this very nice, tidy, well-dusted process of settling a new constitution or at least laying out the periphery or, or, the, or, or the main elements of a new constitution for the future. Now, what, what I'm hoping to, to get clarification on is the way these two very, very different processes interact with, with each other or do not. Is, are, are these things which are going on on two separate tracks or does the whole constitutional effort somehow interact with the chaos that is unfolding on the ground? which we don't, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, we don't know what's going to be the situation in, in, in six months' time. Whether the Tatmadaw is going to be defeated, if it is going to be defeated, how it's going to be defeated, all this is out there. So are these two processes somehow interacting with each other or are they on two completely separate tracks? Thank you. Uh, do you want to address that to, do you have a particular? Well, we've got two left up. So. I'm not sure who else is uh, is there, um, Lynn. Oh, you're there. So, first of all, Marcus, would you like to uh, comment on that, and then, or Jason? Well, just <clears throat> just to be very brief, I think that that's a very interesting question, Tony, and I think they, these processes do interact and interrelate quite a lot. I would not. Uh, I hope we did not create the impression that the constitution building debate is neat and tidy. I don't think that that is an apt description, but it of course needs to come together on something that makes sense. If the FTC was internally incoherent and messy, then it wouldn't really serve much of a purpose. So the effort really is try to pre pre create some clarity in terms of who is responsible for what, etc. Uh, one area where we have seen <clears throat> that there is a, a difficulty in implementing some of these provisions is with regard to the question on who is in charge of local government in different parts of the country that are not uh, under military control. 
uh, and we have seen the controversies uh, between the NUG that actually administers directly some of the liberated areas with some of the ethnic resistance organization controlled areas where there is a separate local administration. And the FTC, to some extent, actually acknowledges this difference in terms of uh, reach of the interim institutions in the section of, of uh, part two on the judiciary, where uh, the FTC acknowledges the existence of judicial structures and systems practiced by the ethnic armed organizations uh, that are recognized and that are considered legitimate. Uh, and in other areas, uh, in other words, in the areas not controlled by ethnic armed organizations, but directly controlled by the NUG, the NUG is expected to set up judicial structures. And that is what we have actually been seeing happening. So I would say that the FTC uh, does interact and interrelate with the situation on the ground. But of course, a lot could be uh, a lot more could be uh, said about that. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Marcus. And uh, just to keep it tight, I, I'd just like to ask each of you uh, if uh, you have views on that question. Um, perhaps we could start on the upper left. Yes, Leon, please. Well, uh, thank you so much for uh, asking that important question. I think in my view, the question of two sides is um, the two sides of the same coins. We cannot separate these two. I think this is a part of our struggle, part of our revolutions. And then I must also tell you that during this uh, drafting process of our Federal Democracy Charter, some of our friends were arrested. They attend the meeting in the morning, in the evening, they were arrested. Some of our friends were killed in the battlefield from Chin State, from Kachin State, from Granny State and then even from Skynet. So I think those who are sitting in this process and discussing this process, we are the same persons, the same group who are fighting on the ground as well, who are demonstrating, who are doing all this job. And I think this is what uh, we cannot separate it. Mm. And, and number two is, for example, myself. Uh, my ministry is for, uh, some people might say that it is for day two, after the re revolutionary period. But I'm also sitting at the Security Council. I'm also part of drafting the member of these uh, local administrations. So we are everywhere, not only in NGC, not only in NGCC, we are everywhere. I'm with the CNF on the ground. I'm with ICNCC, which is Chin Interim Council. So we are the one who are struggling. We are the one who are fighting. And then we are the one who's still preparing for the future. So my question will be, this is not separated. They are not separated. Uh, they are just the two sides of the same coins. I think that is what uh, I would like to answer. Thank That's you. That's a very good way to answer. Um, I, I'll turn to you, Jason, before we go over to uh, Shunli. No? Sorry? I'll pass. Oh, thank okay. You. Thank you. Um, and Shunli? Yes, so since the very beginning, we think of why we organize protests every day, why we're not skipping protests every day. So the main reason of having nonviolent protest and uh, you know movement on the ground is to push for a political change, especially those sitting in the politicization making position, must be that pressure that we need for that change. And and for that, I think uh, whatever we experience on the ground must contribute directly to the constitution making because we need to show that we are different than the military. So whatever military is um, behaving like really bad, then it should be an example that we should avoid that kind of behavior. And that would directly uh, fit into where we are supposed to go to a new nation. So I think that's how it's totally interrelated. That's how we are all convinced as a strike committee that whatever we are doing, whatever we are sacrificing on the ground must be a pressure and uh, pushed for a political change. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Shunlei. 
Uh, okay, so uh, we'll just ask one more question that has been, because um, we have a few online. I was going to wrap, um, I was going to wrap two together, um, which kind of relate to each other. And one is, what are the future arrangements for the future constitutional process? Uh, how, how much do we know of that? Um, and second, how will this process guarantee the separation of powers? Um, I guess that's uh, one uh, primarily for you, Leon, and, uh, and you, Chunli, and uh, the other panelists, if they would like, and then we'll end with that. Shall I start then? Yep. Go on. I think uh, constitution is needed not only to guarantee the fundamental right to the people, but also to uh, limit or control the governing power so that we can avoid abusing power by the government. So the reason that we have a constitution is to limit uh, the government power. So in order to uh, uh, limit the power of uh, the government, what we are doing is two things. Number one is we separated the power between judiciary, uh, at, uh, executive, and legislative. This separation of powers is a must. Without that, I think uh, democratic constitution is, uh, it will not be as meaningful as we hope. So separation of power is so important. Mm. But in a country like Burma, where there are many ethnic groups, where we are looking for a federal system, the very reason that we are looking for a federal system is separation of power is not enough. Division of power is needed. In our country history in 70 years, that division of power is never ever practiced. In the future, what we are looking for, according to federal system, is division of power between federal and state, between union and state. Without that, we cannot guarantee the right of minority group. We cannot guarantee the right of ethnic group. We cannot guarantee the state right. So I think division of power also is very important. I must say from 1947 constitution to now, that division of power is not clearly never ever practiced yet. And then in our future constitution, that will be essential element of our constitution. Thank you. Very good point. Thank you very much. And uh, Tinza, uh, Shunla, you. Yes. So before we say all these words of the federal, like separation of power, division of power or stuff, are we sure all of us are on the same page? Um, some of us who are not yet a part of a democracy charter might want confederation, might want something else. So where are we? Are we sure we are all on the same page? I think that's the first thing that we need to make sure. Um, what is on our table? Show us your demands and where are we? And then we can start thinking of uh, bottom-up planning, bottom-up constitution making stuff not from the central government, but by the states and I mean the state based governments start their constitution, what they want first, and then we can constitute for a national level for a new I think it would take time, but that would be the right process for a new constitution. Thank you. I think that's a perfect way to uh, end this uh, excellent uh, discussion. Um, I'm sorry we've run out of time to come back to the other panelists, but I think you both um, summed up uh, some of the most important issues so well. And uh, I would, I'm going to hand over to Lena to, to close the evening and, and to remind people this was an event sponsored by International Idea, partly to launch their papers. I recommend the website, uh, their website is, is excellent. These are amongst the only group really focusing on on what could become a very urgent and critical question if um, the revolution gets anywhere much more quickly than 
um, than people even hope, uh, you might actually have a situation where you really need to know what the uh, transitional arrangements are and, and what kind of governance system would be in place. Um, so thank you to IDEA and, uh, and also uh, before turning to Lena, I want to thank our technical maestro tonight, Julian Haddon, who saved the day with uh, our rather compli complicated technical arrangements tonight. Um, and thank you all of you, particularly Elliot in uh, Africa, in Sudan, and, um, and uh, Marcus uh, in Europe, and uh, Jason, uh, I believe, in America. So, and most of all, uh, uh, Shun Lei Yi and, uh, and Lian Sokong. And over to you, Lena. Thanks. Uh, I'm very conscious of time. I will be brief. Uh, something I should have mentioned in the, in the, at the outset, indeed, that these two publications, the Federal Democracy Charter, Analysis and Prospects, as well as the new constitution from Myanmar, both are available uh, on our website, International Idea website, in English and in, in Myanmar languages. So I also hope that we manage to bring about some of the finer details of the charter uh, for, your, for your consideration through this discussion. And I think there were a um, number of arguments uh, for, to prove the fact that why, or suggest why the F uh, FDC maybe provides the best opportunity to date for, for constitutional way forward, but also a um, number of challenges and maybe the limitations of the process were also uh, pointed out. Um, I think the Charter really has succeeded in creating this broader mom uh, momentum for this broader alliance with its limitations, at, as was mentioned, and I think the challenge really moving ahead is how do we, how do we sustain that that new attitude, as, as Lian was, uh, was mentioning, the new type of a dialogue and the new momentum that is clearly there. There are a number of uh, open questions. Uh, the how do we balance these benefits of transparency, accountability with the security that Tinzar was also uh, referring to? And also, perhaps most importantly, this uh, broader relationship between NUG and UCC and the broader public. And I think one of the urgent challenges for the interim uh, institutions now is really to disseminate the FDC and uh, what it has to offer of people of Myanmar and to do it in a way that is easy to understand, accessible manner and goes beyond sharing si the mayor, only the text uh, uh, through, the, through the websites. And as uh, Jason mentioned, I think the citizens now need to be assured that there is, uh, that the interim institutions um, actually have a strategy for, uh, for this goal, uh, for, the, for implementation, while at the same time uh, striving to provide as many services as possible to people on the ground, uh, people who are living under the, under the violent attacks on daily basis, as, as Dinzar also uh, reminded us uh, once again. And lastly, that the process needs to stay open to the old and new emerging actors growing from below uh, at the local level, com people's councils, ethnic uh, states councils, uh, particularly as we are designing or the process is designing the political and uh, legislative frameworks uh, for the interim period before, prior to transitioning to the permanent constitution of, of Myanmar. I, I think I leave it there. I simply want to thank if Oh, well, thanks, Lena. And that is a good point. I'm sorry <laughs> we didn't get much time to discuss the emerging state, yeah. uh, the local administration, state councils, uh, but maybe that could be another whole evening uh, for people who are really interested in what's happening, um, which is a very important uh, development. Um, I'd also like to say for those still watching, and uh, obviously you're all watching because you care about Myanmar, the Foreign Correspondents Club of Thailand is also trying to support Myanmar media, independent media, which is more important than ever with all the violence and the internet cuts in the country. Um, it's so important to maintain some kind of independent media and information 
coming out of there if you want to donate or even to give secondhand equipment, um, but obviously in good working order. We are collecting equipment that we are giving to Myanmar journalists and uh, supporting independent uh, media hubs um, that are trying to um, support Myanmar journalists in various ways. You can contact the club. Uh, you can also donate even tonight if you want. There's a box up at the reception or bear it in mind uh, for future. And the other huge thank you I forgot, not, not least in fact, is uh, Dr. Ney, our interpreter, who has been trying to keep up with this incredibly complex. Uh, he's not uh, visible, but thanks, Dr. Ney. And thank you all for listening. Uh, we have a good uh, series of events this month at the club and tomorrow night we have a very interesting book launch and talk about uh, US-Thai relations, the history of with Benjamin Zawaki. So um, keep an eye on our website and Facebook and thank you very much all. Thank you everyone. Have a good evening.